watching This Week in Space with Miles O'Brien. Brought to you by Binary Space, reliable space systems. Hello and welcome. Mr. Bolden goes to Capitol Hill this week. The NASA boss is a former Marine fighter and test pilot and astronaut, and he's used to taking flack. After all, he flew 100 combat missions over Southeast Asia during the Vietnam War. So facing off with some lawmakers on Capitol Hill over the controversial Obama-NASA budget proposal, piece of cake, right? Well, it started out that way. He began with the Senate Subcommittee on Science and Space. The chairman, his former shuttle crew member, then Congressman, now Senator, Bill Nelson. Uh, General Bolden, you've just made some news because you have stated that the destination is Mars. That's the goal. Do you have, in what you have just stated, do you have the approval of your superiors? Sir, the words I used have been through uh, every wicket I can think of, so, um, so it, I assume that that means I have approval to say that. Uh, all the way up through the wickets of the White House as well. All the way up through the wickets of the White House as well. And, and I would comment, Senator, that um, when we went to the moon, um, we, we didn't know what we were doing, but the moon's a couple of days away, and so we felt confident that that would not be a problem. When we take on Mars, it's radically different, and it offers radically different challenges. So I cannot give you, unfortunately, whereas President Kennedy said he wanted us to go to the moon and safely return humans in this decade, I wish that I could ask President Obama to do that. He could, he could issue that challenge, but I can't tell him we can do that. Because at this particular time, I can't provide a date certain for the first human mission to Mars because there are too many capabilities that we don't have in our kit bag. And uh, so I'm hopeful that through the technology demonstrations and te technology development that we will undertake with Mars as the focus of our design reference mission that we'll be able to get there hopefully quicker than we would have before. Suffice to say, it went downhill from there. Senator David Vitter, a Republican from Louisiana, home of the Michoud Assembly Facility where they make the external fuel tanks for the shuttle, is calling Obama's space plan radical. And he says it's not at all what the Blue Ribbon Augustine Commission had in mind when it scrubbed the Constellation program. Mr. Administrator, what relation does this very dramatic change of vision have with anything laid out in the Augustine Commission. I mean, point us to a page of the Augustine Commission report that really suggests anything like this. Senator, with all due respect, I, you know, I, I don't really think that this is a radical departure from, it's not a radical departure from the vision for space exploration, if I can say, and it's not a radical departure from any other visions or, or dreams that people have had about going to space. Uh, what is different is it funds what is necessary to realize that vision. I, I, somebody once told me a, a vision without resources is a, is a hallucination. Uh, if you look at where we were prior to the 2011 budget, we were living a hallucination. We had a great, I won't use the term great, we had a vision for getting to back to the moon, getting to Mars and other places in our solar system, but we did not have the funding to do it. We didn't have the assets to do it. We now have the assets to make an, an orderly progression to getting humans to a place like Mars, and I'm confident that we can do that. Again, I just disagree. I believe the consensus opinion reaction to this budget is that it is a radical departure. And if vision without resources is a hallucination, resources without vision is a waste of time and money. And, and that's what I think this, this budget represents. Uh, Mr. Administrator, fin final question. You said you're a member of the NASA family, and you are. And I absolutely uh, know uh, that you want all the best for those folks and, and feel for them and are supportive of them. But this budget canceling every major internal human spaceflight program in sight, most obviously Constellation, uh, extends their gap, as I said, to infinity. So what do you tell those people in the NASA family? 
Senator, as I have told them in the last two weeks or so since the budget came out, uh, I tell them I, I don't know how they feel. Um, my kids are 38 and 33, and they're out of school. Um, so I don't know what a young engineer with a 15-year-old kid feels like right now. I know they're hurting. And um, if they happen to be a civil servant, I can tell them that they're going to be okay because they're going to have a job. But then as a young lady told me at Johnson Space Center, I don't want a job. I want to be able to come to work every day and feel that I'm making a difference. And uh, so I can tell them, as I have, that I'm going to do everything in my power to try to make sure that we develop some programs that are going to help us get to where, they all, where we all want to go as soon as possible. I don't think we would have ever gotten there with the Constellation program set up and funded the way it was. I don't think anyone said Constellation was a bad program. I haven't read that anywhere. Um, but I think that we can develop capabilities that will allow, potentially allow us to get back to the moon, and because we are going to go back to the moon, and will enable us to get to Mars much quicker than we would have under the quote unquote program of record. The next day, Charlie Bolden found himself in a different orbit, namely the House of Representatives, where they don't know comedy with a T from comedy with a D. And when he appeared before the House Science Committee, it was so silly you almost had to laugh as members from Texas, Alabama, and Florida tried to out Bolden bash one another. Um, what is our next destination for America in space? The next destination for America in space, and I'm not being trite when I answer this is the International Space Station. We've got to get there four more times this year. Uh, the big, the long-term destination, after we successfully close out the space shuttle program, uh, the ultimate destination is Mars. And there are intermediate points that we are going to have to get to before we are capable of going to Mars. If you gave me all the money in the federal budget today, I could not get a human to Mars. I could not morally put a human in a spacecraft and launch them on an eight-month mission to Mars because I do not understand the radiation All right, so what is our next destination in space? The next ultimate destination is no, Mars. No, the next one. Congressman, the next destination, as I said before, is the International Space Station. And All we've right, got let's to do that not be trite, then. What is the one after that? It's Mars. So there's nothing in between, as far as you're concerned. But there are intermediate stops what are the they? way there. What's the next one? The moon is a, is a destination. Lagrange points are destinations. Which one is next? You mean, where do we go immediately next? Is that, is that the question? That's what next means. Congressman, I, we are in the process of developing a program. I will, ha I will have to be able to give you the details, and I will come back and make it for the record in the coming months. So why are we even talking about how to get to the next destination? We don't even know what that is. Congressman, we do know what it is. We know what, what it is. What is it? Congressman, I, you know, we can go back and forth uh, forever. We seem to have to here. I'm looking for an answer. Okay. The next destination in the Constellation program was the moon. What After about that, there now, was, since you're uh, planning to eliminate the that. program of record and the program to which we are working right now, uh, because you have told me that I have to continue to, to work the Constellation program, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the 2011 budget, but if you ask me right now, the next destination is the moon. Honestly, I'll tell you, my time is up now, so I'm going to tell you this briefly. I think that what you're doing is taking a shot in the dark. You have no way of knowing if any commercial entity will ever be able to put a man in orbit, no matter how much money you throw at them. What you're doing is you're taking NASA's manned space program and making it a faith-based initiative. If you want to see that exchange in its entirety, click on the clip called Bolden versus Grayson in our YouTube channel. By the way, you can see all the hearing action in its entirety if you're having trouble sleeping. While Charlie Bolden was trying to land some support for that new NASA budget on Capitol Hill, the Space Shuttle Endeavor was fresh off its nighttime landing at the Kennedy Space Center. Main gear touchdown. The six-person crew, led by Marine Colonel George Zamka, the guy they call Zambo, logged a successful mission to the space station, installing the Tranquility Node with its stunning cupola. 
Matter of fact, station keeper Soichi Noguchi watched Endeavor streak through reentry from there. He tweeted that the view was definitely out of the world. Not a haiku, no, but he uses left side brain. I cut him some slack. Bet you didn't know it, I was a poet. From haikus to minuets, Twist is taking you upscale this week with the precisely choreographed move from horizontal to vertical. And no, I'm not talking about getting out of bed with a hangover. I'm speaking of Discovery's move from the orbiter processing facility, or hangar, to the big vehicle assembly building for mating. Now, don't worry, teachers. Shuttle mating is G-rated. It's all about connecting the orbiter to its big burnt orange external fuel tank, which has the solid rocket boosters attached to it. The finished product, the space shuttle stack, is slated to begin a slow roll to the launch pad on March 2nd. Launch to the space station is set for April 5th. Don't forget, the best place to watch the launch is on spaceflightnow.com. When the shuttle stops flying, the U.S. government will no longer be in the business of building spacecraft for its astronauts to fly into space. We can only hope this is a temporary suspension in membership of a very elite club. Still, the Obama space budget says the National Research Council will take a hard look at the role and size of the astronaut corps. No bucks, no need for Buck Rogers. But in India, they're ready to invest some rupees on future Ramu ramjets. The nation's space agency says it is ready to join the club. They're vowing to send a pair of astronauts into space in the next six or seven years. It's not wise to curry. And from our very busy last ever desk, an item this week from Big Love Country, northern Utah. Rocket builder ATK staged its last test firing of a shuttle solid rocket motor. Awesome. Beautiful. Since 1988, ATK has conducted 34 ground tests to verify performance and safety margins and test new materials. ATK says it will march ahead with a static test of an Ares 1 style booster. Even though the program is a goner, NASA has already paid for it and the tests will go on. It's time for us to take a deorbit. When we relaunch, we'll take you to one of Saturn's moons where they appear to be making snow for the ski season. We'll tell you about the amazing ice jets of Enceladus. Welcome back to This Week in Space. Saturn's moon Enceladus is spewing out some impressive geysers of water ice. The NASA ESA Italian Space Agency team that flies the Cassini spacecraft just released this composite image captured in November showing about 30 of the jets near the south pole of that moon. The big question for those who are interested in life beyond our planet, could there be liquid water reservoirs beneath the surface there? Now, as you know, wherever water is found in liquid form on this planet, you will find living things. So, let me be the first to tell any prospective Enceladonians, we come in peace. Another ESA satellite is focused on water as well. It's just a little closer to home. These are the first calibration images from the Soil Moisture and Ocean Salinity, or SMOS, mission. Launched in November, this satellite is designed to help scientists better understand the water cycle on Earth, and that will help them improve weather and climate models. Back now to our top story and the seismic shift at NASA. The Obama budget for the space agency puts some big bets on some commercial players to work more independently to get cargo and ultimately humans to and from low Earth orbit to the space station. But there are a host of concerns about transferring so much risk outside the space agency. One of the main players in this game is Orbital Sciences. Like its competitor SpaceX, the company is building a vehicle to deliver cargo to ISS under contract to NASA. Veteran astronaut and NASA manager Frank Culbertson is now a senior VP with Orbital, and he was listening intently, as I was, when his former fellow astronaut, Hoot Gibson, said this in that Senate hearing. Uh, I don't think that we could arrive at the right place if we just say we're going to build it for cargo with some relaxed requirements, launch it a couple of times and see what our success rate is and then declare it safe for human spaceflight. I think there's going to have to be a rigorous process that we go through in the same manner that we do on the vehicles that we develop ourselves. So what he's saying is 
a level playing field when it comes to requirements for human rating. Do you agree with that? Well, I think what he's really saying is that there's a, a minimum standard you have to meet, um, no matter what vehicle you're using or who's providing it, in order to ensure safety of the uh, of the occupants, particularly in spaceflight, as hard as it is. And um, I would basically agree with what he said. You can't take just a basic cargo vehicle and say, as he said, fly it a couple of times and then then uh, bless it and say it's ready to go for people. There's a lot more to it than that. So if you have to meet the same human rating standards that have always been in place for NASA, is it possible for the commercial sector to do it any cheaper? Um, that's hard to say. Uh, those standards are changing. And in fact, uh, NASA and the and industry are working together this year to, uh, to improve on those standards and make them uh, turn them into something that can be um, uh, implemented uh, commercially and, and, and through industry. The, the thing that really needs to be looked at is from a systematic standpoint, do you really understand your overall safety and do you have ways to, to mitigate problems as they occur, such as a, as a highly reliable launch, launch escape system to get the crew off a rocket that might not be working right? Well, is it possible that the standards as they are written right now um, for NASA, are, are they too high? Does it need to be looked at once again for what is reasonable safety? Well, as I said, they are looking at them again, and they've had a fairly extensive effort going on inside NASA, and now they're going to open the doors to that and, and bring industry in to, to put in our uh, assessment of, of what needs to be done and what, uh, what can be done under uh, a commercial effort. But a commercial entity such as Orbital or SpaceX can do it just as safe as NASA, you think? Uh, I think that we can arrive at, at uh, a safety level that anybody would be willing to fly on, but we have to prove ourselves and we have to make sure that we're all in agreement on what those, uh, what those standards are. Uh, but it will take some testing and it will take some development to, to reach that point. All right. Orbital is a company that has not gotten a, a nearly as much attention in this whole debate as SpaceX, Elon Musk's company. Uh, I have heard um, your CEO say that you're going to actually beat SpaceX, Falcon 9, to the space station. That true? I can't predict the future, Miles. It depends on them and us. Um, our current schedule shows us flying our first mission to the space station in early 2011. Um, I'm not sure what their latest schedule shows. I know what what they're doing right now at uh, KSC, and I've heard Elon say that he intends to fly twice this year, uh, which leaves two more flights before they actually berth to the station. So we may be on about the same schedule. What do you think? What do you think about the idea of having this competition between the two of you? Competition's always good, and that's the name of the game in, in commerce, right? Uh, yeah, I guess the concern might be that corners might be cut. Well, that's always a concern in any high-risk endeavor. You've got to make sure that people understand that uh, you can't cut corners in a situation like this, and you've got to make sure that you're doing it right every time. Uh, you want to incur efficiencies, and you want to be cost-effective, and you want to, to, if there's fat in the system, you want to get rid of it. But you can, there are minimums that you have to maintain, and whether you're flying people or cargo or driving uh, a train across the country or flying a commercial airplane, uh, there are minimum standards you have to meet no matter what. And, and I guess a space race worked for us in the 60s. This is just a different kind of space race. Well, I think you're going to see lots of space races going forward. Uh, as the commercial world becomes more and more involved in, in space operations, uh, in fact, it's already happened uh, when you talk about commercial or, uh, communication satellites and earth sensing satellites and, and uh, uh, photography from space. The, the race is on, and people are looking for ways to do that um, more efficiently and, and less costly and, and beat everybody else to the marketplace with new technologies. So this new budget, this Obama budget, really uh, jumpstarts all that, doesn't it? It has the potential to do that, and we anticipate that uh, if the budget is passed as, as written right now, there would be money in the budget for 2011 to uh, begin studies and design activity on, on uh, crew transportation systems for, uh, for non-NASA uh, industry. All right, final thought here. Um, Charlie Bolden, the NASA administrator, told Congress that uh, Mars is the ultimate destination. But of course, there's no, there's no dates, no deadlines, no specific plan, no mission specifically, just some technology incubation ideas. Are we going to get to Mars that way, you think? 
Uh, you can't get to any uh, serious destination that's difficult to get to without a series of uh, way stations, waypoints, if you will, if you're in an airplane, uh, or uh, milestones you have to achieve, uh, technologies you have to develop. So I'm sure, in fact, Charlie has said they are working on uh, developing a plan they will roll out this year that will show what uh, NASA's uh, intentions are for those kind of milestones. Um, I think we've seen over and over in the uh, space program and in other high technology areas and high risk areas, you don't achieve a, a big audacious goal like that without immediate milestones that you have to uh, find both achievable and challenging. Frank Culbertson with Orbital Sciences. Thank you. You're welcome, Miles. Good to see you again. After we finished the interview, Frank reminded me I didn't ask the question. Would he go on whatever human-rated spacecraft Orbital finally builds? He says he's already volunteered, and he might fly with Orbital CEO David Thompson. I believe that leaves an open seat for an intrepid space reporter, doesn't it? Hmm. Kids love space and dinosaurs, so I have always believed that if we could put a dinosaur into space, we would have a nation of space-loving high achievers in math and science. Well, voila. Astronomers using the Hubble Space Telescope have found some galaxies that are tantamount to seeing a dinosaur wander into your backyard. It's a group of small galaxies that are still in the early stages of formation. But they're much closer to us, only 166 million light years, and thus much younger than galaxies at a similar stage that scientists have seen before. For some reason, these small galaxies waited 10 billion years to get together. Now that's a long courtship. Space used to be a place where the political parties didn't get into their usual childish food fights. But this week has been a reminder that nothing is sacred inside the Beltway anymore. And now we found another potential wedge issue. It's up there in the stars. It turns out a quarter of the star clusters in our galaxy, the Milky Way, are actually aliens that migrated to our neck of the cosmic woods. The study comes from Swinburne University of Technology in Australia. So let me get this straight. If any of those galaxies should happen to harbor life forms, they would be alien aliens. Quick, someone build a wall. It needs to be about 100,000 light years in diameter. Does Lou Dobbs know about this? Maybe the prospect of an alien invasion would get more people interested in space exploration. But short of that, it is important that those of us who have a passion for this remember to bring the taxpayer along for the ride. Maybe one day literally, but definitely now figuratively. That was one of the points I made to Senator Bill Nelson this past week when I got a chance to testify. You noticed things that have to change and that NASA has to change. How can you, I'm asking you an impossible question, but it's one that we have to, we have to ultimately answer. How, how do we get from the doom and gloom of the perceived program through this paradigm shift to make and remake a new NASA? It's really important we bring people along for the ride, one way or another. And I thought it was really, uh, I, I was struck and impressed that there is talk in this budget about participatory exploration. You know, uh, if you think about it, NASA has really pioneered this whole notion of bringing people along for the ride. You know, it really started way back in the Mars Pathfinder days when scientists would be seeing images on Mars, at the same time, people at home were watching them on the internet. The more we bring people along for the ride, the more they're going to be a part of this whole process. And that's why I think, you know, if we can figure out how to thread the engineering needles that, that Hoot has laid out here, and that's very important that this is a safe way to fly. I don't think anybody in the commercial sector would tell you they want to do it in an unsafe manner. If we can figure out how to do that, it portends tremendous opportunities for a lot of people to go to space. We've had 500 people go to space since it all began. Two, two of you are in the room here, and I uh, wish I had had my opportunity as well. We should be, we should be sending 500 people a month. And uh, it, it, for NASA to figure a way to get out of the way in low Earth orbit and allow this industry to thrive, I think will uh, enthuse the public in ways uh, we can't imagine. I remember being out there to cover that X Prize back in 2004, October of 2004. It was positively uh, electric in, in the atmosphere out there because 
even though it was a suborbital hop, something we did in 1961 with, uh, with Alan Shepard, it was just a rank civilian doing it. You don't need the right stuff. And I think if NASA can make that happen, make it possible for more people to go and bring people along for the ride in other ways, I think they'll, they'll recapture that connection to the public. I sure hope that guy in the tie and glasses is right. He looks familiar. Pierce Brosnan, right? Anyway, I better get out of here. Thanks for being with us on this edition of This Week in Space. We appreciate your support of our efforts. Thanks for the financial contributions you sent us via PayPal at spaceflightnow.com slash twist. You can drop us an email at twist at spaceflightnow.com. We got a good one this week from David Sheriff in the UK. He writes, Mr. Bolden seems so negative as the senator is saying over and over again, no goal, no ideas, no target. Are you going to let another nation, be it China, Russia, or India, take over this? Because in this scenario, that's what's going to happen. He says NASA should stand for not absolutely sure about anything. Thanks, David. You can also send us a tweet at This Week in Space or leave a comment on the blog version of the program, milesobrien.com. Next week in the program, we'll take you to the place they call the Space Coast, where there may soon be a lot more space as the post-shuttle exodus begins. The hard landing everyone dreads there next time on This Week in Space. We'll see you then.